Baik, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat siang menjelang sore Bapak Ibu sekalian. Um, izinkan saya untuk memandu pada sesi yang keempat ini, yaitu tentang sesi uh, know-how dengan narasumber Miss Lian Chen. Miss Lian Chen ini adalah Accreditation Service Manager untuk Asia Pacific Region dan beliau sudah bersama ACSB selama lebih dari empat tahun. Dan pengalaman beliau sudah melayani berbagai sekolah-sekolah di kawasan Asia Pasifik, sehingga beliau cukup familiar dengan konteks keberagaman dan kompleksitas yang terjadi di negara berkembang seperti di Indonesia ini. Kemudian um, topik yang akan beliau bawakan adalah tentang how to be accredited by ASCSB. Bapak Ibu sekalian apabila memiliki pertanyaan atau hal-hal yang ingin disampaikan dapat uh, dipersiapkan untuk kemudian nanti di Tanyakan setelah uh, sesi presentasi. Um, Miss Lian Chen, uh, you have 45 minutes to present and floor is yours. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, so I'm Lian Chen and I'm one of the accreditation managers based in the Asia Pacific office. We have another one uh, of uh, my colleague, Amy Mammon. Uh, she's not here today, but she's based in India. So some of you may be schools that are receiving support from her. So between Amy and I, we service the Asia Pacific region. Right, so I'll be introducing to all of you about uh, accreditation. We will cover the philosophy of accreditation. I'll be sharing about the process and timelines. Um, then I'll be going through the eligibility criteria. Because for many uh, schools in Indonesia, you are interested to find out more about how you can apply for accreditation. So that's one area that I'll cover more. Um, then we'll do a brief overview of the standards, uh, followed by the Q and A. Uh, that's where you can ask me any uh, more uh, detailed questions related to the standards, because it's been covered in quite detail uh, from the two the two experiences that I've heard from uh, different schools. Okay, so you all know um, ACSB accreditation is mission driven. So what does that mean? That means that um, you can have a school in. China that is ACSB accredited, a school in Singapore that is ACSB accredited, a school in Indonesia that is ACSB accredited. Because even though we have 15 accreditation standards that focus on high quality and continuous improvement, but they are applied uh, according to the context of the school uh, in which it resides. Right? So it's interpreted uh, in slightly different manners. Um, and there's also a layer of uh, self-assessment, which as mentioned earlier, um, initial self-evaluation report, what's that? So it's about schools uh, evaluating themselves against the 15 accreditation standards. Um, there's also peer review. So peer review is handled by um, very experienced reviewers who have got good knowledge about the accreditation. Um, they come from accredited schools and they typically have a lot of experience, maybe leading their schools through this process themselves, can be serving as a director of accreditation, uh, associate dean or dean or equivalent. Um, and also, the standards are guidelines, not a checklist. So by now, you kind of know that because it is mission driven, so you are applying it in different contexts. So the standards don't say, this is how you must do it. It must be done this way, and there's only one way. No, they serve as a form of guideline. Uh, you interpret it, and you think in terms how you can uh, use the standards to help you go towards high quality, but you think about it in the context of your mission. Um, and we have the three teams, engagement, innovation, and impact. So this is actually the mission of AACSB as well. It is to foster, um, foster engagement, accelerate innovation, and amplify impact. And it is the foundation of a good business school because business schools, they need to be uh, engaging with the society that they reside in. And they need to um, innovate in order to respond to the different kinds of trends that face the world today. We mentioned a lot earlier, technology, um, innovation, disruption, artificial intelligence. How do you make tweaks to the curriculum so that you can prepare your graduates to take, into, take advantage of this kind of changes effectively? Right. And then, of course, creating that impact in the society that you are in. Right. So these three themes will be um, addressed as you go along with the standards. You find that you are also um, addressing the themes. So initial accreditation process, um, I put it very simply because for many of the schools, maybe they're not so familiar with these terms. And as you go along in the process, you'll find these are the key volunteer groups that you'll be working with, the ones in bold. 
So the initial accreditation committee, they are a group of uh, about 30 to 40 um, accredited deans and equivalent. So they meet regularly four times a year and they go through all related uh, accreditation submissions. Uh, this is for schools at the initial stage. Um, and then you have the mentor. He's someone who, he or she is someone who works uh, very closely with the school at the initial stages uh, when the school has just entered the process. Because at this point in time, the, the school is really evaluating the itself against 15 standards. The mentor will go to the school, that do a visit of the school, try to find out a bit more about how this school is operating, what's so important about the school, the stakeholders the school serves, and try to ask questions to stimulate the school's thinking uh, and, and try to find a way where the school can address the standards in the context of that environment. Right. And, and this process takes place uh, through a, through a uh, certain time frame where they work on an initial self-evaluation report and the initial um, self-evaluation report updates, which I'll be talking a, bit, a little bit about uh, more later. Um, and then the other group is the peer review team. So the peer review team, they will, um, it happens when the school is at the final stage of the accreditation. So the final stage of a school uh, seeking accreditation is the visit. So that's when the school will uh, stand to the test of the peer review team's uh, judgment as to whether the school is meeting these uh, standards for um, high quality, as well as in achievement of the school's mission. Right. Um, the other two committees that you see here, the CIRC as well as the AAC, these are relevant more to schools that are not in the, more to schools that are pursuing uh, other stages of accreditation. The CIRC is for schools that are already accredited. So accreditation doesn't stop um, once the school is accredited, they move on to this phase we call continuous improvement review. Um, and accounting accreditation, so they will review accounting related uh, submissions. So these are the main um, accreditation submissions also that schools going through the process will, uh, be, pre will be preparing. Right. The first stage, the first step to entering the process is to submit this eligibility application. Um, so they'll address six eligibility criteria and they'll try to demonstrate that they have the resources, they have the ability to get accredited within a certain time frame. Right. So one thing that, um, just to emphasize is that there is a timeline for when once, a, when, for when a school is, uh, getting in getting aligned in alignment with the standards so once the school enters the process they have a maximum of seven years and schools will want to be able to demonstrate they can get accredited within that timeline uh, in the eligibility application one there's one way for a, a committee members to uh, judge if the school is ready to be accepted into this uh, initial accreditation process so once a school's eligibility application is accepted, um, so as mentioned, the school will then start working on this initial self-evaluation report. So they'll be analyzing how they address the 15 accreditation standards. Um, this report is a very detailed report and uh, it asks the school to be realistic as well as objective. Okay, so it's, for example, um, each standard the school will answer, answer whether, have I, am I already in alignment with this standard? Yes. If I am, why? How have I, how am I aligned? For example, I have a good mission uh, process in place, review process. Um, this mission is very distinctive. It serves these specific groups. But if you are, if the school says, no, I have not aligned, that's okay, because this, you are given time to um, implement changes to align. So the, EACSP accreditation process gives you that time to get into alignment with the standards so that uh, by the end of this initial stage, you are prepared and ready and you have already um, addressed the standards, you are ready for that visit. Okay, so this, therefore this ISR is um, asking you to be objective, to have a clear plan in place to get into alignment with the standards. Uh, we call this a gap analysis and, and that's what you want to submit to the committee. So schools will have up to two years for this process. Some schools take one year, uh, some schools take two years, right? It really depends. Um, once this ISER, we call it for short, it gets um, accepted by the IAC, um, the school will be asked to then implement the changes that it needs to take in order to align with the standards. Because earlier on, 
the school says, um, I have not met this standard, you know, maybe standard, uh, standard 15, I may need to uh, have more, raise the quality of uh, the percentage of uh, qualified faculty in this area. And I anticipate, you know, over a three year time frame, I plan to have this amount. So I plan to hire more, uh, improve research. So these things, um, once the ISA is accepted, the school is going to be implementing all these plans that the school already outlined earlier in the ISA. And this it does so through the um, through this three-year time frame of implementation, which is the third, uh, third point you see. Um, and that is when the school will be submitting regular updates to the committee in the form of uh, ISA updates. So these, these are really like uh, common terms that you hear throughout the process. So what's the difference? The ISA update is a much um, shorter report than the ISER, the ISER. Whereas the RSR was detailed standard by standard here, um, it focuses a lot on the closing gaps, on respond so specific standards, and are responding to uh, questions that the committee may have. Because the committee will review all these accreditation submissions, uh, they will provide feedback to the school um, through the decision letter. So during each of these uh, stages, the school will want to show that it is able to respond to all these um, questions, and it does so through these updates. Right, so this um, a school has a maximum of three years to get into alignment and close gaps. Um, some schools take less than three years before they get invited to the final stage, which is from step four and below, beyond. So the committee makes a judgment on whether the school is in a good position to stand to the test of the peer review team uh, two years from, from then. And it does so through reviewing all these submissions that the school makes. So this can happen anytime. It can happen through the ISR. You know, the school, wow. A 100 page report is really very thorough, really done all the work, ready to move on to the final stage. That can happen, but very rare. Um, then, usually schools take time, they have some gaps to close. And this takes place, uh, usually um, can take up to the three updates. Some schools have, um, take two updates. Right? So, it really depends. Um, then, when the committee feels the school is ready to go to um, apply for a visit, they ask the school to fill out this application form where the school will indicate um, when it wants the visit to be. So this is done through um, uh, putting in a few dates and then also nominating um, whom it, the school would like to be have on the peer review team who will come down to the school for the visit. Um, from the time when the application is submitted, um, the visit usually takes place about 15 months to 24 months uh, from the application date. So during this time frame is really the final stage of accreditation. When schools get to this stage, they are really usually very happy because you know a lot of hard work that they put in results in this uh, really preparation for the final stage. Um, they prepare that final self evaluation report. So if you look closely, the ISA and the final self evaluation report they are very similar in terms of the acro the way they are the acronyms. So the reason is because they are very similar in format, right? So schools. You want to know that um, first, in the initial stage, it was 100-page report, standard by standard analysis. Here, final self-evaluation report, same. It's just that here, you are addressing how you have already addressed all the standards. Okay, so um, this self-evaluation report will go to the peer review team. Because right now, you are preparing for the visit. Uh, your mentor no longer works with this, your, you. So you're working mainly with the peer review team chair. Uh, he kind of he or she kind of assumes the role of the mentor, um, assists the school in understanding um, more about what the school context and and then also working in trying to get the school to um, uh, meet the school his expectations of how the self evaluation report should should be like. So the school will work closely with this peer review team chair, um, and the peer review team will review the self evaluation report, prepare a pre visit letter to the school. So this letter is sent as a form of preparation to prep the school for the visit, uh, highlight some issues that you know maybe the, the peer review team wants clarification on before the visit. Could be like, um, can you please provide me with the CVs of this? Please provide me an updated table. So things like this will be submitted to the peer review team. And the school does this through uh, what we call the response to the pre-visit letter. So the school will submit the response. So this here you can see um, it's a total of, we say, seven, seven years time frame. So now you know how this comes about, why we say seven years. This is the stages. But it does not mean that you really take seven years per school. It depends. Okay. 
Um, I've also put up that committee meeting date because um, I get a lot of questions on when committee meetings take place and I think it's good to refer to this uh, so you can plan ahead. So uh, IEC meets four times a year. Right. Um, what, so this is just a flow chart. I won't go through this in detail. Uh, it's also in your notes. So basically what I've mentioned. Okay, now we look into the eligibility criteria. So a lot of schools, um, as the very first step, they need to submit uh, eligibility application to this uh, IAC. So IAC review this eligibility application and make an assessment of whether the school has the ability to um, get accredited within the seven years time frame. So this eligibility application has six criteria. The first three, they are more about uh, core values of the school. Uh, so the school wants to demonstrate that it has these core values that are very important and what ACSB feels is important uh, for a good business school. Um, we, we talk a lot about ethics. Uh, it's important for the business, for businesses and business schools and for the kinds of talents that business schools produce to be accountable to the public and to show that you know, the students that graduate, they have, they are, have are people of good moral character. So how are these basic things are part of the infrastructure of the school? You want to have, um, make sure that the people in the school are well aware of what's uh, ethical behavior, what is the code of conduct. Uh, and how is this being educated to them? How is it a part of, for example, the kinds of activities that they do? It could be in terms of uh, the policies of academic uh, uh, plagiarism. What, what kind of, what, what is considered plagiarism? So what are these things that I think a lot of schools already have? And it's all about uh, right, putting them into writing in this eligibility application. Okay, then collegiate environment. So this represents the sharing of information between peers towards these two areas of uh, learning and scholarship. So at the higher education level, a lot of it is uh, the kind of exchange of information of how you can ensure that uh, the students are able, through the interactions with the faculty, able to improve on their learning. So what are the ways where uh, the what are ways that the school allows for interactions between uh, students and faculties? So again, um, documenting the different examples. It could be, for example, tea sessions, uh, some uh, guest guest lectures, even with the community, so interactions outside of the school with uh, key stakeholders, we talk about engagement. So these are things that you can give examples of. Um, and then also, this collegiate environment also means shared uh, power to influence the kind of outcomes. So here, we are not talking about top-down, you know, you have one dean who gives all the instructions and everybody has to follow. It's not like that. I mean, we respect and we see everybody as peers, they contribute to this decision making, the governance of the school. So you want to show how faculty, even students, may be involved in that process as well. Right? I think a lot of schools have this, and uh, when I see eligibility applications, which I review um, and give feedback on, I, uh, it's good to give examples of, of all these things that you say to really describe the, uh, what, what's going on in the school. Okay. Um, commitment to corporate and social responsibility. So again, I think for me, it relates to um, the kind of responsibility that business schools have in this world. Uh, ACSB says uh, businesses and business schools are a force for good. So this is where you, know, you can show what you as a school is, are doing, uh, helping your students to get, uh, to be uh, morally aware, to have uh, the, the, what, what's important in today's world in terms of the kind of competencies, um, uh, respect, and for respect and global awareness, respect of different uh, uh, cultural views, different ideas. How is this being a part of uh, the programs that you have um, um, in terms of the kinds of faculty ratios? Maybe you may have some visiting faculty sometimes, or cross exchange of faculty. So how is that diversity being represented? So you give examples. Okay. So these three um, earlier they are the Okay, sorry. So we earlier talked about the core values. Now we look at the foundation for a review. So a school also needs to talk about what kind of resources they have, uh, sustainable resources to support the school over time, not just in these seven years, but uh, in terms of being committed to high quality in this accreditation process. Um, for accreditation scope D, I will talk a bit more about that later, but one main thing is to have uh, ACSB membership. That's a prerequisite. 
Um, the next one is oversight, sustainability, and continuous improvement. So here you're looking at the kinds of resources that you have at the school in terms of, uh, I think a lot is covered earlier as well. You, you, your human capital, the faculty, um, then you have the infrastructure, the libraries, the buildings, um, physical assets, computer labs. So, so these are trends that you have that you want to describe to the uh, committee in this uh, EA, what kinds of resources you have in place over time, the trend to um, show that you're in a good state. Right, and also mechanisms, uh, you know, you, you want to ensure your, your, your operating systems, not just uh, academic-wise, but, you know, financials, things are, there's a process to check, ensure accountability to stakeholders. So what is that? You, you want to describe that. Okay, then the uh, final criteria, F, uh, is basically saying that um, schools need to show integrity in their submissions uh, to represent, to, to, to be truthful in the, in the representation of uh, what, the, what the school is all about in the reports uh, and the understanding of the seven-year timeline to accreditation. Okay, um, actually this part here is kind of new uh, to this uh, EA. Not, not so new anymore, but it's, it's, uh, it came about last year. So this session is, section is really assisting the committee to determine how ready a school is uh, to get accredited within a seven-year timeline. Uh, they ask school to fill out the faculty de composition um, by, by, the kind, by the qualification that they have, um, bachelor's, um, master's, uh, doctoral. Um, this helps them to review whether a school has, uh, what kind of percentage of qualified faculty a school has at the start. Um, and also the research activities of the faculty. Okay. So if at this point when you're filling it out, you know, you may have heard from some colleagues who are in process, they say you need to have maybe at least 40% of faculty who are uh, doctoral qualified. Maybe at this point you're writing, you think, mm, I only have maybe 20%. What does that mean? Does it mean I cannot get into the process? Maybe I should give up? No, that's not the case. So you, you know, because at this stage, you are still not even in the process, you're applying. What you want to show is, and in the, when you, once you're in the process, you are given time to improve your faculty qualifications. You know it's a seven year time frame. Over here, what uh, you, want to be, uh, you want to do is do a convincing job. Let the committee know that, you know, I may, only, I may be only 20% qualified at this point in time, but I have a strong plan in place, the resources uh, for, um, trying to encourage more of a research culture in my faculty, perhaps to uh, focus on practice-oriented in intellectual contributions because they do so much work related to government, to community. So I think they're at a good point. Maybe I, I have some kind of policies to guide them towards improving their research and hopefully I can move them over to uh, improve the qualified faculty percentage. So you can talk about the plan that you have and, and the timeline as well as the uh, what kind of funding. So this is good for a committee to see, you know, the, that the school can do it within that seven year time frame. Um, the other part is also the research culture. So they, the, school, the committee wants to know um, how the school plans to ensure that the portfolio of intellectual contributions, the research, is aligned to the, com the mission of the school. So you will discuss that and also talk a bit about you know, the research strategy that your school has. What, what, what kind of expectations do you have of the faculty to, in to improve on um, the research activity within the school? Okay, then um, we now look at scope, which I skipped earlier. Um, this is basically asking for what is to be accredited. When a school enters the process, what are we accrediting? Okay, the, we are accrediting the, the, um, the entity. We need to look at um, whether it is the university or the business school. So um, in the past, it used to be just the university that uh, is the accreditation entity, which means that all business degree programs in the university, regardless of where they are housed, are under the scope of accreditation. Mm -hmm. But in Asia context, Asia Pacific, we have different we have uh, differences in organization structure. You have more than one school that offers business degrees. You could have, for example, a college of business and a college of entrepreneurship. So they are very different in focus. They have different um, students, stakeholders. One wants to develop a lot of technocrats or technopreneurs and, uh, to help local businesses. The other wants to, um, you know, just traditional business school that offers, that has um, students serving in different industries. So in that case, because of the different mission, different strategies, 
a school can choose to uh, go for a unit of accreditation, which is where only the school uh, that applies to be unit gets its degree programs um, in the review process. So by that I mean if it is the school of business that applies to be that wants to apply for accreditation it and not the school of entrepreneurship, then the school of business would submit this uh, additional application, which is called academic unit of uh, um, academic unit of accreditation. Uh, once it is approved, then only degree programs of this school of business are in the scope. Whatever is in the entrepreneurship uh, school will not be in it. So this is uh, an extra additional step that goes before the um, applying for uh, accreditation. And um, if because it's so different for different schools, so if you all have any questions, then you can either contact Amy Mammon or me, and then we can look into this um, in closer detail. Okay, right. So I think I'm doing quite well in terms of how in terms of progressing, right? So we are already at the final part, which is the overview of the accreditation standards. So we have these four buckets: uh, strategic management, innovation. Um, participants who is in the business school, uh, we have learning and teaching. That's one huge area we want to ensure students are learning, um, and academic and professional engagement. So, um, altogether, fifteen standards are um, categorized into these for for a good reason because of the similarities. Um, strategic management and innovation. It is the first three standards are. Uh, Firstly, as you all know, mission is ACSB accreditation is mission driven. So uh, a school really wants to think about its mission before anything else, before starting how it, you know, what kind of programs, who it wants to serve. It has to be clear on what its mission is because the mission drives uh, everything else, the whole directions. And that's why you find it as the first standard is good because it sets the tone for the other standards. And I think. Um, in the past, we used to have a lot of missions that are more generic. You know, all schools which are top business schools in the world, global business schools. So, um, if you have many schools around the world which all want to be global, then um, they are a bit similar in some way. And also, in then you means that everything else, including the research, uh, the kinds of faculty that you have, they have got to meet that standard. Right, so you want to be clear on whom your stakeholders are, what kind of communities you serve, and more important, how what is so distinctive about uh, your school? Because ACSB accreditation is uh, thinking about the context that you serve. So think about what ways, what kind of industries, uh, for example, agricultural, maybe on micro businesses. You focus on those areas. So this is what you like to. This will help you to define um, what's really important about your school, and it helps you in then looking at the rest of the other activities. Okay. Um, then intellectual contributions uh, is also fundamental. Um, it helps in developing the knowledge capital of a higher education institute. So for business schools, they have uh, qualified, they have faculty who teach. The knowledge has to be current. So in terms of intellectual contributions, uh, therefore it, there is that necessity to, to do it. Um, and we ask that it's aligned with the mission and financial strategies. So um, this relates to standard one because in the, in the mission, uh, it, we also ask um, the school to give the strategic plan of the school. So this will, this, will, um, this will have strategic initiatives or action items that a school will be achieving over time. And um, the financial strategies is typically linked to this strategic plan in that uh, you want to have uh, resources that are allocated to, each of, to these strategic initiatives as indicated in your strategic plan. So, so key, key things that um, IAC, the committee, will review, right? And um, now moving on to the next bucket, which is participants. So uh, these are the key stakeholders in a school. You have the students, you have the faculty, and you have professional staff who take care of a lot of the different kinds of uh, support functions, yeah, support faculty. So we have one standard for each of them. Uh, faculty, we have two, right? So students. Um, it's important to be clear about um, the kind of the admission standards for students by program, 
and you want to ensure that when a student is accepted into your degree program, they are, um, they are supported along the way. If they need assistance, what kind of policies in place do you have to support them over time uh, to ensure that, you know, for example, if they, they are not doing very well academically, then what is being done is intervention. Um, and what's the career development uh, for the school for the student like? So you can talk about policy systems that you have to support the students. You can showcase student outcomes that are successful. You know, placement. Um, so all this I think most business schools have. So it's all a matter of uh, placing them in this standard, organizing it well. Then faculty sufficiency and deployment. So this is about. Um, how sufficient the faculty, the, the, your faculty resources are in covering all areas that are important to a school. Uh, it goes beyond just teaching because uh, you want to, you, a faculty, uh, school doesn't just teach, but there are other things like um, service to key, key groups, perhaps like community service work, uh, then research is one part. So um, you, will, you will want to ensure that you have the resources. Um, I won't go into detail to this standard, but you can ask me questions if you have later. Right then, faculty management and support. So this is the HR standard for a school, uh, for a faculty. You, when a faculty enters the school from the very beginning, how do you support them along the way so they are able to meet their career aspirations, their uh, research, expect, uh, research aspirations? Are these expectations of their performance clear to them, like orientation? And um, is there a way to support them, to help them grow in the school? So this is one standard that uh, a lot of schools do well in because they are able to show evidence. Professional staff uh, sufficiency. So this is about uh, people like myself, or you know, like we, we are not faculty, so we so, so support the we support the school um, in different ways. Could be student support services, alumni outreach, uh, marketing, uh, even research assistance. So how are these staff? They are also very key to a good a school, right? You don't want faculty to be doing this work. So do you have sufficient professional staff to uh, support this school? Um, to ensure running of this school. So faculty do not have to do certain work. So and how do you take care of these people? So that's what the standard is asking. Okay. Then learning and teaching, um, curriculum management and assurance of learning. Um, this is a standard that takes time for most schools to um, get to, to, to master because it is, consists of a system that you have to measure the performance learning goals. Basically, it's about um, uh, are you sure? Do you know how? Uh, are you able? So, um, how uh, are, stu are your students learning what they are supposed to learn? So, you want to know about that. Then, do you have a system that measures um, students' performance on this learning? Right. So, you have learning goals in place for your programs. So, you will determine what they are based on your mission. And then, you have a system. You you collect. Uh, data from on the students' uh, performance, and this takes time because you have to. They have to. Students have to submit uh, reports, assessment. That's where you do measurement, um, and then you look at the results. Uh, you come up with some analysis. Uh, you come up with curriculum interventions. So the data from these students' performance will drive improvements that you make to the curriculum. Uh, so this is a system. We call it closing the loop. Like you heard, and it takes time. Right, so um, we have this is this is a standard that people take a bit more. Then as uh, curriculum content is uh, what's in the what's in the cu curriculum. Um, it should normally have what uh, is in a typical business program. So AACSB uh, has a has a list of what's uh, generally uh, expected in a. Uh, business degree in terms of the kinds of uh, management skills, for example, finance, marketing, uh, and also um, uh, general skills like leadership, ethical reasoning, things like this, which um, most business schools have. Student-faculty interaction. So, uh, so um, how, what kinds of innovative ways do students um, get access to qualified faculty? So, uh, schools also can get creative here. Um, the standard 11 degree program educational level structure and equivalence. So uh, does your degree, is it structured to uh, be appropriate for that level that uh, it is being taught? For example, you have a master's degree program. It's a three-month master's degree program. So is that considered normal? 
only it's only three months. So you know these are things that we as uh, we think it must meet the general expectation for uh, that level of uh, that degree program. Then teaching effectiveness. So how well, uh, how do you ensure that uh, teachers can improve on their teaching? What kind of policies do you have to support them? Okay. So we look at the next uh, last bucket: academy and professional engagement. Uh, student academy and professional engagement. Another standard where um, schools tend to show a lot about like experience, things like experiential learning, project work, internships, things that engage the students academically and that go beyond academy. Look at uh, professional engagement. They are stimulated to uh, really f uh, think about their work. It's not just a traditional classroom, but you know they get to see through internship how what what's really going on in the workplace, and then they they feel more inspired when they go back to the classroom. Okay, um, so executive education, Tom mentioned that earlier, it is only uh, applicable if uh, you, you know, it's uh, more than 5% of total resources. Typically, it's the kind of like professional seminars, uh, corporate, corporate uh, programs. Yeah, so um, basically, it's to measure whether the clients, your corporate clients are satisfied with the programs that you offer. Do you have that system to measure that? And how does that help you in then your delivery of your core, your degree programs? Maybe how does it complement that? Okay, uh, the last one is the one that everybody is talking about, faculty qualifications and engagement. So um, if, if you are a student, I think just basically to uh, explain what it means. Uh, if I'm a student, I would like to have qualified faculty teaching me. Um, I would like them to, so how, how, do you know, how do you know whether your faculty are qualified? How do you ensure that they are? So through two ways, uh, through academic engagement and through their professional work. Uh, it could be their credentials, um, minimum credentials. Perhaps they came from an uh, academic background. They have a doctoral degree. Uh, it could be from professional experience. They have been working as a director for 10 over years. So, so this is their initial experience that, qual that qualifies them to teach you. Then there's another layer, which is if they have been, they have been with the, the school for so long, like so many years, uh, how do you know that they are still... Um, qualified, you know, if they got their degree like more than five years ago. So what are the ways you quite try to engage them to ensure that they keep up to date and current in what they're teaching? So a school, we have some recommended um, percentages that we talk about for qualified faculty, but schools will draft their own criteria on, on each of these categories. So schools determine that uh, based on their mission, right? So um, basically, I think um, that's all for me. Um, these are some useful links that you can find more information about um, the actions, the, the timeline, the FI you get the eligibility application, um, some useful events to learn more. Um, so any questions and comments? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Lian Chen, for your uh, very thorough presentation. And now it's time for uh, Q&A. Silakan Bapak Ibu sekalian yang memiliki pertanyaan yang spesifik terutama khusus untuk AACSB, monggo. Bapak yang di belakang silakan. Okay, uh, terima kasih. Terima kasih. Saya Yosef uh, Rako dari Universitas Katolik de La Salle, Manado. Now saya ingin bertanya that you mentioned that uh, at least you know uh, a school should have spent at least seven years to get pre let a prayer visit, if not I'm mistaken. But then, you mentioned also that there are some schools that uh, just get less than seven years. So what are the criteria, or what are the factors that make them, you know, get less years, less than seven years, and then the other, let's say, you know, seven years? Yeah, so, you get my um, point? So seven years is the maximum timeline to get accreditation. Some schools do um, say they get a shorter time frame. Um, really depends. Some schools might, before even entering the process, they have already like, actively um, learned about the standards, maybe through networking. So they could have already been at a position where they are meeting most of the standards uh, prior to entering the process, and that can shorten their time frame. Um, I think a lot of times the main thing that we hear is really the commitment of the team. Um, you know, so, so I think most school journeys usually there may be some uh, hiccups here and there, but um, one good way is to have enough um, courage to have the leadership support uh, to, to help, really help the faculty get the buy-in 
Because sometimes faculty, they have their differences in opinions, but how do you uh, position this accreditation as a way which is a high quality um, way, a, a system to ensure high quality, so get the faculty to be in support of this. And I think that's one way that it can help to uh, uh, fasten the process. Okay, so if I'm not mistaken, that school that get, let's say, you know, shortened time for get the first uh, proficiency because, you know, they already prepared long before they apply for this AACSB accreditation. Is that correct? Yeah, it really is a case, case by case. So um, it's not saying that, um, you know, if a school takes a longer time, that school is um, not a good school. Um, some schools, they, you know, if... It really depends. Some schools, you can see if they are um, larger schools, but again, depending, may take more time. You know, whereas compared to a small school, it may be easier to make to drive in certain changes because accreditation is a change management process. It involves really a lot of uh, differences, you know, um, operations that need to be changed if there is a need to be changed in the first place. So it really depends. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um Sambil menunggu pertanyaan dari Bapak Ibu yang lain, uh, we have a questions from uh, Super Event dari Ibu Katrin. Uh, based on the explanation, we have to have a clear and reachable vision and mission in which uh, they are different entities but should be closely connected uh, and align one another. Um, the question is, should the mission is in one reachable statement because uh, sometimes there are missions reflecting one vision. Maybe one vision could be represented into different kind of mission or something like that. So um, the mission can be a set of statements. So we call it mission statements. So it can include a mission as well as a vision. Um, the vision is the aspirational part. Uh, how how the what the school sees itself in future, whereas the mission is what the school doing uh, in reality at the current moment. So uh, ACSB accreditation, we focus mainly on this mission. Sometimes we take into account the, the vision. I mean, I see schools that um, uh, I see, they may take into account that vision, but the main thing is um, the mission. From what I hear in a, from a facilitator, um, he says that a vision you can dream as big as you want, but the mission is what grounds the school to reality. And as to how many statements um, or how long, um, this depends on the school. I think something that a school can identify with is important to the, to um, everyone in the school, those stakeholders. Thank you. Um, I'm Yulia from FAPL Camp. Um, I want to ask something about uh, continuous improvement, actually. Um, regarding the uh, student academic and professional engagement um, for the undergraduate program uh, there is a little bit of problem with the professional engagement because the professional engagement uh, the, the industry the ideal time uh, to engage is around three to six months which increase the length of study of the undergraduate program which is maybe it's not really in line with the national accreditation uh, thing. Uh, do you have any um, example of the successful professional engagement for the undergraduate program, the business school? And how uh, is the measurement of the success of professional engagement? Thank you. So um, just, just to clarify, uh, are you saying that it does not um, align with the national accreditation for if, if the undergrad program does not um, meet the timeline. Um, uh, there's a, um, uh, for example, like the length of study, uh, the maximum is uh, maybe double the, um, is that the length of study seven years uh, for the undergraduate program? And usually um, it's not really related like um, in, uh, for example, if we, we compare with the postgraduate program, uh, they have um, project, for example, uh, or maybe they have working experience in a certain industries that they can uh, write it down as a thesis. But for the undergraduate program, um, mostly it's not like that. The the, uh, the type of the research, um, how to deal with the, the professional, uh, how to improve the 
professional uh, engagement for the undergraduate? Um, I think professional engagement, it depends, again, it depends on the school, what the school feels is important. Um, can come in many different forms, like you have the internships that I talked about earlier. Um, so I guess this varies in duration from schools. Maybe one way is to shorten the time frame so that you can meet your, your national um, accreditation uh, requirements. Um, but um, I think for, it can be about, it really, really depends. When I was uh, stu studying in, in university at undergrad level, it was three, three months, uh, it was one, actually one month, but that may have changed. So I think one way you can find out how schools themselves are doing, um, you know, by right, networking and then think of what's the best, uh, what, what's appropriate for your school. But ACSB accreditation, we do not um, specify that as a restriction or we don't say, you know, you, you, must have, you must be a certain timing or that. We, a lot of it, we ask the school to determine on themselves based on the mission. Um, based on the kind of program offering, whether it's more practice oriented or not, it may justify a greater um, timing of uh, practice, uh, practice work with the practice. Okay, um, another question from Super Event. Uh, the question is from Ari Kusumawardani. And uh, how RCSB approach those business schools which show no progress or maybe slow progress during the accreditation process? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, so um, I mentioned uh, there is um, a time frame. Every, there, there are stages to the initial accreditation stage. So the first is the ISA, then you have updates where you make progress uh, based on your ISA. You try to address uh, standards, key issues. So the, um, then when you, when you address these issues, you will detail the progress in an update report. This is submitted to the committee. So the committee will review it and um, when they feel that sufficient progress has not been made, typically um, they, may, they will may write it in the decision letter. So the school, uh, sometimes the messaging is a bit stronger. You know, this is an um, issue that was mentioned, uh, standard five. So please provide an update in progress. Uh, usually school is given time to, to work it out because you have that three years time frame where you are slowly um, making progress and committee sees that as long as it's reasonable, you are not expected to immediately get the issue uh, resolved within one update, within one year. It takes that time. So I think what is more um, a concern to the committee is um, when schools' um, issues get, do not get um, through, even after three years or even after two years, it's still not address and there is this evidence that maybe no progress has been made. Um, so that happens sometimes. Um, then also some schools may show they do not know what, uh, they do not detail, do not address the committee's uh, issues. So earlier I, uh, committee will say this is an issue, right? So school want to provide a response. Sometimes you get uh, responses that may not address the concerns. And if it is uh, fundamental, uh, committee may feel that the school may not be ready to progress um, for now. So they tell the school, please take a step back. Um, you know, I may want to review yourself, look at, review your processes, take some time off. So we call that, okay, so the word is redrawal. They um, recommend that redrawal to the school, but usually this is when there is very significant um, concerns that have not been addressed over time. And um, you can see that through the kind, the quality of the submission that is being um, put to the committee. Uh, the withdrawal period is for a one year time frame. So usually that withdrawal, the school, if they are still keen to pursue accreditation, they are working to um, resolve all these issues such that when they enter, re-enter the process, they are in a better state and they can continue with the accreditation. Okay, uh, silakan Bapak. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to continue on the withdrawals, um, if we have withdrawn uh, from the process, either you go through the eligibility application or the ICER, um, should we start over again? Or thank you. For withdrawals um, at the state of the ICER, you resubmit the ICER. Yes. So, um, so if you are at the ICER stage and ICER update stage, if you are submitting ICER update and it gets. Uh, 
reject, the, uh, the committee asks, recommends a withdrawal. So the resubmission will be the ISDR. Because sometimes I think fundamentals may not, the fundamental is basically in, found in the ISA, your plan to move with the standards. So if there's no sufficient progress, which is in the ISA update, committee will say, please take a step back, review your plan again, develop a stronger plan. You know, it's a good chance for the school to reorganize and therefore it's at the ISA. Uh, for eligibility application, um, we, we asked the school, so we asked the school to um, put it in. I think if it's a revise and resubmit, a school can still submit it um, within a year. Okay. Um, withdrawal, I believe, uh, it's about three years. If, if the second time the EA gets rejected, then they have to wait three years to re-enter. Because at this point, you know, before you even enter the process, the committee is actually assessing whether you uh, have the resources to be accredited within seven years. So uh, if at the second submission, it's still similar issues, you know, shows like maybe not so much of understanding uh, of what's required to, in terms of resource-wise or even certain standards to that need to be met within the seven-year timeline, then um, the committee will say, please wait for the like, three years before you re-enter. Okay. Um, another question from uh, Super Event from Bluturnas Titi. Would it be possible to align ACSB standard with our national standard? Because we have to work with multiple documents, different timeline, but single salary. So Yeah, I think that's, that's a very good idea. And I think we... That's, that's really what, what um, earlier Tom was saying and you know, we met with the Ministry of Education, Higher Education. I think one way is to find a way to streamline this process. Uh, this is what we hope. We have done this with um, a few other countries. Um, in the Netherlands, it's a, it's a streamlined um, effort between the Ministry as well as uh, ACSB. And I, I, I think definitely we can have the closer look to see how our standards are overlap for Indonesia and ACSB. Oke, okay. um, satu lagi barangkali Bapak Ibu sekalian, bila masih ada pertanyaan yang ingin disampaikan, ya, silakan. Oke, okay, uh, terima kasih Pak. Uh, just one short question again, but I'm, I'm, I'm quite surprised that no one has raised this issue. Uh, regarding the budget, so as uh, Pak Eko just mentioned earlier that as a public institution, public university, that we have some concerns, particularly regarding the budget. And can you provide us with details on a yearly basis? It will be much uh, preferable regarding how much should we spend on the membership uh, fees and then... <laughs> I think this is important because uh, the decision to, to, to join the membership or not is highly depend upon the uh, membership fees. And yeah, uh, regarding the uh, memberships and then uh, the mandatory Uh, meetings or seminars that have to be attended by the uh, lecturers and so on and so forth. Yeah, I, I have you. the, I have, we have this information. Um, do you want it verbally now? <laughs> so, or I can um, send you the links because, yeah, so I think we have this all on our website. Um, I will send you the link, um, but just to, just to say in case you all want to jot it down, uh, membership fee is 3,300 USD annually. Um, so, then once you apply for accreditation, uh, the eligibility application uh, is uh, 2,000 USD. Um, when you get gets accepted, uh, there is an IEC process fee acceptance, so that is um, 6,500. And then and no fee is 5,950 USD. Uh, yeah, and the events, um, key events, I, um, I think the Main, main thing is to get an understanding of the standards, so BAS is uh, very helpful. That's where you meet um, a very experienced facilitator uh, who really goes through with you um, details, uh, details by details, two days of the standards, and you can ask a lot of questions. Um, then typically you have a lot of schools who are in the process who also have the same questions as you, and there's a lot of like brainstorming involved, so that's one. Um, Then there is the assurance of learning seminar. That, that takes a while uh, system. You need to learn about how you get the system in place. So these are the two key seminars. Um, I think I will get your name card after this, so I will give you more details. Okay, thank you. Um, last but not least, maybe do you have any kind of tips or advice for schools or universities who are pursuing 
or planning to pursue ASCSB accreditation based on what you experienced so far? I think the you can one thing is to check with Amy Memon or me. <laughs> so I would suggest that you all contact us uh, when and then we can go through you know case by case with your school whether you are pursuing it as a university level or uh, is it a, a school level because that's the first step to accreditation. Then I think a lot of things have been touched on earlier. Uh, Dean Echo and then Dean Suda. So you all talk about how it takes a lot of drive, commitment, uh, leadership. Uh, it needs to be. Um, strong to support the people, the support staff, uh, the professional staff who are really working to coordinate the accreditation efforts with the faculty. So to that whole commitment thing is uh, one big factor. Because there are ups and downs along the way, but um, the key is to keep thinking about your progress. That is what counts. And your overall, this is a journey. You are moving towards the quality. So there can, can be these moments, but you are progressing. Um, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, those are uh, our colleagues who have gotten accredited, they will have a lot that they can share with you on what it takes. Okay. Again, um, thank you very much again for your uh, very thorough explanation and presentation. Uh, please give a round of applause, of applause to Ms. Lian Chen. Terima kasih Bapak Ibu sekalian atas waktu dan perhatiannya masih bertahan sampai sore ini. Waktu uh, sesi yang keempat ini saya tutup. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waktu dan tempat saya kembalikan kepada moderator.